Good morning. Hey, good morning, Professor. Uh, how are you? <laughs> I'm fine. Thank you. Uh, you look like uh, you have uh, very cool weather in uh, in Mexico. Yes. Mm. Yes. Not not too much, but but it is uh, cool uh, now. Uh, I, I I don't don't know how. Uh, it's higher the temperature, but uh, uh, it is uh, more or less cold. <laughs> A little yes. bit unusual for this time of year. Yes, <laughs> but uh, when we go to the end of the year, it used to to be more more cold. <laughs> It's the cold time of year for you, <laughs> but yes. of course, for cold it means like twenty-five degrees or something, mm. right? <laughs> for for mm. me, that's that's too hot, you know, too too, too much. hot. Uh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Okay. Okay, Professor Garrett, how are you? Buenos dias. Good morning. Buenos dias. Mm. Mm. Larissa and Gregory Kosan is here. Okay. Good morning. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, Jesus, uh, I will uh, uh, set your, uh, uh, let's see, this thing where I, I change you to be host, mm. or at least co host, I guess. Yeah. Anyway, so. It doesn't make much difference, really, but <laughs> okay. But uh, mm -hmm. just officially, uh, that way you can be uh, in charge of the time. Tell me if I speak for too long or whatever. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps uh, you should wait another couple of minutes. Yes. How is everything in in, Me in Mexico? Uh, in, I think that, that it is uh, okay, uh, but uh, some um, um, uh, okay. Uh, may, maybe you look like a, a, a cold days, but uh, I have one ba background that it's. Uh, <laughs> 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 Making a, a makes it look different. like you're really cold. Yes, really cold. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but uh, just now uh, is the sun uh, 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 rising, and, and then uh, it is more hot now. Then uh -huh. uh, can't can the clima. It can be the clima. Terminó las lluvias. Terminaron las lluvias, sí, yes. sí, sí. Y empieza un poco calor y frío, ¿no? Sí. Okay, bueno. Yeah. Um, okay, Greg. Gregor says he's he's here. I see a note from him on the chat that says he's here and he can see and he can write, but he can't speak. I, I don't know. Maybe he has some problem with the microphone. I'm, I'm not sure. But, uh... <clears throat> All right. Uh, let me start, I guess, in the usual way. We can, we can just take a look at the uh, uh, the short agenda. I can find it on my screen. Yes, here. Uh, now, share this. Yes. Okay. Um, so, uh, Garrett, uh, I uh, 
I wrote here uh, the information that you said in the last meeting. Um, yeah, I think you sent a short chat and, and at the time, I think it was in response to uh, uh, Greg as quotes and uh, oh, what you wrote is perfect. Very nice. Thank you. Grassi. Thank you very much. It was perfect. Okay, so that's, and that's no problem. And, and you will be available next week. Um, on Wednesday, same, same time, same station. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Okay, and uh, Dr. Santilli also communicated with me uh, that he was available for a presentation the following, the week following that on November 3rd. Um, he'd like to continue to talk about uh, what he calls isocalculus. Um, I encouraged him to do that as a follow on of his last presentation because I think he more or less got to that point of, of mentioning that that the idea of uh, isotopy uh, uh, gives rise to changes in in the way one wants to do calculus. Um, so I, I'd like to know more about that. I, he's also sent me several references um, to material. I think maybe he sent it to everyone uh, on our list. Um, and I've I've tried to go through some of them, but I do I do have a lot of trouble. So so I need, I'm going to need more help to understand uh, this whole concept of isotopy. And uh, so that one uh, still looks promising, but something something new for me to understand. Uh, I did trace it back as far as uh, with some references to about 1945. Uh, uh, an algebraist uh, named Albert, uh, who wrote uh, some of the initial articles uh, about the concept of isotopy. Um, and in particular, he was especially interested in non-associative algebras, but, but the same thing applies in general. So I still don't quite follow the whole chain to, to get to the point where uh, uh, Dr. Santilli is talking about um, um, isotopic Lie algebras. That, that's a little bit beyond me at this point. In any case, um, what else? Uh, so we may have even more on that in the future, especially if somebody else has, has questions or something that you'd like uh, uh, Santilli to address. Uh, he doesn't seem to be showing up here today, but that's, that's okay. We can still send him messages. Um, and of course, if anybody has uh, plans or, or suggestions for uh, additional presentations, uh, just you know, let let me know, and we can try to schedule it. Um, see how that goes. Uh, and other than that, uh, I guess I could just carry on and start giving my presentation. Um, I'm not going to make a very formal presentation at all. Um, so, but let's, um, if no one else has any comments. Um, yeah, Coach Chan said he, he couldn't hear very well if you can turn up your volume. Oh, I see, I hear, oh yeah. Okay, let me try to do that. Uh, not that way. Um, Audio settings. Okay, is that is that better? Um, does it sound louder? I'm I'm not so sure. I'm, yeah, I'm changing. It is better now. <laughs> it's better. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I just I I do for some reason on this computer I have trouble with adjusting the. It, there's a fun there's a checkbox here that says. Uh, automatically adjust microphone volume, but every time I click on that, then uh, it seems to adjust it to be too low for some reason. I, I don't know. So, so I have to override it. Uh, okay, so um, let's, let's get started then, I guess. Um, this can go somewhere else. Uh, no, that's all right. Um, I want to do here. I'm still sharing that screen. Okay. So 
let me uh, start sort of at the end um, because I I wanted I wanted to sort of start at start at the end and then maybe work backwards a bit. Um, but the overall uh, objective is is to understand um, uh, Zbigniew Oshevich's, uh definition of acceleration in terms of the Lie bracket. Um, this is the Lie bracket of the time-like vectors associated with uh, two observers, or two, two material objects, where material object X is the observer and material object Y is, is the thing being observed. Uh, measure, well, I, I don't want to say measured because that that is uh, an issue that I I guess I addressed to a certain extent during the part of my presentation that I gave at GOL, which was trying to emphasize that Olshevich's view of velocity in general is as a as a physical property uh, of a pair of bodies. Um, so he has no no concept of velocity that is not uh, a property of a pair of material bodies. Um, so x and y, uh, although in conventional relativity might be called four vectors, uh, we should not be thinking of these uh, x's and y's as as velocities per se. They are just uh, time-like vectors that are used to characterize a material body. And um, Oshevich traces that idea that, that one would represent a material body by a time-like vector back to uh, Minkowski in a paper that Minkowski wrote in 1908, um, which even predated some of the earlier ideas about space and time as geometry. Um, what, what Minkowski was doing um, was looking for um, a mathematical approach to describe uh, what Lorentz had um, discussed in relation to in, in relationship to uh, electromagnetism. So the whole notion that Lorentz had the notion that that electrons when they moved actually physically contracted uh, due to stresses. Uh, in the bodies and and Minkowski, what Minkowski was doing was was abstracting this mathematically and coming up with uh, a formalism, which which later became very well known, right, in terms of uh, Minkowski space time. Uh, but at the same time, he also defined uh, a concept of relative velocity uh, that is not the same as as the concept of relative velocity uh, that was adopted later um, in, in relationship to what became known as Lorentz transforms. Um, so at the time, Minkowski wasn't too worried about Lorentz transforms other than the way in which they interacted with geometry. He didn't attach any physical significance to them per se. And that, that's fairly important, but uh, I'm, I'm sort of backing up too far, maybe. Um, if at any time uh, I'm rambling on or <laughs> doing something that that is uh, off topic, or if, if you if you feel like asking a question, you know, like please do so. Uh, okay, maybe all right. So Greg, Greg is. is says at least that he can hear better. Unfortunately, I'll just have to keep an eye on this chat window, see if he actually asks me a question or not. <laughs> All right, where are we going? Okay, so so this is just, um, this is from um, a copy of a paper by Oshevich. Um, let me just skip to the top so you can see the title. Uh, So this is one of the last papers that uh, Zbigniew published. Uh, it was published uh, only on a lesser known sort of journal uh, and in, and in a, an abbreviated form. Uh, and what I have here is 
a revised and expanded version that is available, uh, I'm quite sure, on ResearchGate, um, but it's but it was never published per se. Uh, so the original presentation was given uh, on July, July uh, 2012, but but over a period of time, Olshevich um, uh, updated it considerably and, and lengthened it in many ways. And so this is the, the, I think what I have here is actually the copy that he sent me um, in, in early uh, 2017. Um, and this, this was really the basis of most of our conversation, like between uh, Oshevich and myself, it was, is what we talked about uh, basically up to a few weeks before he was no longer able to uh, communicate. He was still, he was even in hospital at the time, I think when he sent the last emails. Um, so some of the things that I'm going to talk about are things that I discussed in depth with uh, Oshevich and a few others. Um, I never really got the chance. I was sort of interrupted by his illness. But I found this paper rather difficult in general because it the paper is is uh, focused on on algebraic aspects uh, in detail and and geometry definitely comes second in this paper uh, to the extent that it comes at all. Uh, I, I was going to remind um, Garrett uh, about a paper that uh, Oshevich wrote back in uh, about 1975, I think, um, short, shortly after he had met or discussed uh, um, geometric algebra with Hestes for the first time. And uh, Oshevich wrote a paper that, that explicitly claimed that, that it, Clifford algebra wasn't necessary that everything that someone might want to do in Clifford algebra was already implicit in uh, Grassmann algebra, uh, including uh, what Cartan, the way Cartan ex, ex, um, extended it to, to include uh, exterior calculus. Um, so uh, do, do you recall that paper, Garrett? Uh, <clears throat> yes, I, I've had many conversations with Spishik about about uh, and of course I was present when uh, he was uh, talking with uh, uh, Hestenes about these ideas and uh, uh -huh. uh, there's quite a history to it all of course. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and I was a bit when I read that paper I was a bit surprised how how early in his uh, sort of professional career in effect uh, Zbigniew was promoting ideas that were sort of uh, uh, in a different direction than the mainstream. But in spite of that, he continued to be fairly active in Clifford algebra and so forth. But well, I think yeah, I hope to, to actually show uh, in my talk next week uh, how <clears throat> geometric algebra really is geometric and all the concepts can be pictured uh, geometrically. So, so I hope to convince uh, Professor Koch and uh, uh -huh. of that as well. So yeah. well, it will also touch on the subject we're talking about right now, of course. Yeah, which is uh, like more more uh, of an algebraic view, like looking at Grassmann algebra not as being about geometry, but really about a particular algebra. Yeah, I'd like to just say one more thing. So from what you say, then, Spishik was thinking then uh, an inertial system is determined by a, a Minkowski unit vector and, and a time, take, time like pardon a time like a time like vector a, well actually a unit vector for well it, it Normal, doesn't matter normalized time yeah. like vector yes uh, so the the Lie bracket of that in 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 Clifford algebra will be a bivector then which of course is the way Hesney's looked at it and the way I look at it as well well, the usual definition of Lie bracket is of the same degree as what you're taking the bracket. So, so if you if you take a Lie bracket of of two vectors, the result is a vector. Well, we'll have to talk more about that uh, 
uh, later, I guess. <laughs> but but something like the exterior derivative, say the if you well, I I'll, I'll, I will talk about that later, perhaps, uh, because I I need to be able to describe uh, the covariant derivative in terms of um, of the uh, uh, intrinsic uh, operations like the exterior derivative. Um, so, so what is a Minkowski four vector? If you take the leap leap bracket, you're taking a product. So, what, what's the definition of the product of anyway? <laughs> mm -hmm. No, no, no. That I mean, that is exactly the right question, and that that is dealt with uh, in an abstract way in this paper. Um, let let me just skip on to. I don't I don't want to go into too much detail. Maybe I should skip to my uh, slide presentation. But um, in any case, I was just going to point out that that this paper, the main goal of this paper actually doesn't have in, has not directly related to acceleration at all. But he, uh, Oshevich was really especially interested in the notion of uh, center of inertia for um, many bodies, a relativistic center of inertia or center of mass. Uh, and he, he points out that this notion is very difficult to express in conventional relativity. Um, and one comes up with several different answers that are not uh, consistent with each other, including at least one answer that makes uh, uh, the center of mass a non-local concept, something that can only be defined globally. Uh, and it's still very much um, a research subject in relativity to to know the correct way of defining center of mass. And I think the reason why Oshevich was especially interested in that was because it turned out that in, in Oshevich's approach to relativity, uh, this notion of center of mass is, is very easily defined, at least in principle, right? It's, uh, it's, it's a well-defined concept, uh, unambiguous in detail. And the main reason, of course, for doing that is that uh, Oshevich was working towards uh, a uh, relativistic dynamics, a, a new formulation of relativistic dynamics. Um, but most of his work up to this point was just kinetics. I mean, we're just, just talking about how things move. Um, so anyway, uh, let's. I think I've said enough of that for now. Maybe maybe I can refer to this later. Um, let, let me skip over to this um, now. Um, maybe I'm a, I'm still going backwards in my presentation. This is like towards the end of the presentation. And what I'm, what I wanted to emphasize here is the relationship between the Lie bracket and torsion, or how the Lie bracket enters torsion in differential geometry. Uh, and so I can just point to different expressions here, perhaps. So, so this is the um, directional covariant derivative with respect to x. Um, but it's written on the right-hand side in terms of intrinsic operations. Uh, so G is this um, uh, isomorphism, metric isomorphism, sometimes called uh, musical isomorphism. Uh, and it is defined by the uh, multiply, multiplication by the uh, metric tensor um, but it's important that it that you think of this operation as a mapping between uh, vectors and covectors and vice versa so so this this mapping um, given by the metric is converting this vector y into a covector uh, and then operating on it with the exterior derivative and then inserting or evaluating. Uh, Oshevich liked to use the word evaluation instead of insertion. Um, 
it's usually written in a lot of the notation it's written as a as an i with a subscript x uh, the re there's a technical reason why he wanted to do that uh, because uh, well we can we can go go into that later uh, so so what we're doing is from from this vector y, which is a time-like vector representing a material body, uh, we generate a covector using the uh, metric tensor, and then we operate on that covector with the uh, exterior derivative. And so that gives us a two-form, uh, and then we insert the um, uh, vector x. Oh, here's Dr. Santelli seems to have arrived. I, I apologize. I, I had a car problem this morning. And I, I'm sorry. Hmm. No, no problem. Welcome. Thank you. I'm so sorry. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll just complete what I was saying and then I can give a, a quick uh, Thank you, what uh, I review so far. Thank you. What I what I miss, I will I will listen to on, on the recording that you kindly indicate sent me. Thank you. Oh, okay. Yeah, yes. you, have, you haven't missed very much. Uh, I was just reviewing basically um, Oshevich's um, the metaphysics uh, associated with um, relativity, and uh, and then I more or less uh, skipped directly towards the end of of my presentation because my my idea was that if I start at the end, then at least I have finished what I want to say. <laughs> and maybe I haven't wasted too many people too much time because people, if they understand it clearly, then I don't have to go <laughs> too far back. But so I'm sort of working from the back towards the front uh, in a general sense. So so this is what this is part of the general conclusion here uh, relating the importance of relating the Lie bracket to the covariant derivative, uh, which is uh, a, something referred to as Cartan's structural equation for uh, differential geometry. It's one of two equations that are important uh, in differential geometry. And I'm quite sure that they were first written by uh, uh, Cartan. Um, Okay, so what I was just, uh, just uh, as, uh, when you joined Dr. Sindeli, I was explaining this uh, expression 21, uh, equation 21, which is a definition of the covariant derivative in terms of intrinsic operations. Um, so um, having generated the two form from the exterior derivative, uh, we then evaluate that two form uh, by the observer body x by the time like vector associated with the observer's body so we at this point we still have a one form covector but we're going to map it back into uh, the space of vectors um, so in the end doing this uh, is exactly the same as the usual definition of the covariant derivative in a given direction, direction defined by x. Um, in the case that uh, the uh, torsion is zero, and well, the, tor uh, the torsion of, is zero in, in this, is presumed to be zero because of the implied connection that, that is written here. And the, the connection implied by these uh, Intrinsic operations is the Levi-Civita connection, which is known to be uh, uh, to have uh, zero torsion. So, so that that's not, none of this is uh, particularly exciting, but I'm just reminding you of this result uh, in differential geometry, because that that will be important to me later. Uh, what else did I want to mention here? Uh, okay. Uh, as I 
Let me just skip back to Yoshevich's paper, or maybe, maybe I should skip forward to. Oh, wow. What do I need to do from here? Uh, okay, well, one, one thing, I, I'm going to skip to one other thing because I know that uh, 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 Greges in, in particular uh, was anxious that I show him my final result, uh, that I show the final result, which was the uh, calculation of the Lee bracket for uh, a particularly simple case. And in Oshevich's paper that I pointed to earlier, let me go, let me jump on to that again. So we'll jump back to Oshevich's paper. And, and in this paper, he, he sort of left an, an open question, which uh, I think but that, I, that I spent quite a bit of time trying to solve in that Greg is also, uh, has told me that he's solved, but we haven't been able to get to the actual details yet. Now, let me understand. Oh, yes. Okay, this is right here. Uh, how do I do this? Okay. And so, so it's this particular paragraph that that Oshevich wrote in still in this version of the paper and he hadn't he hadn't completely solved this or at least he he didn't put the solution in this paper and he uh, he implied um, in a sort of usual way that that this should be left as an exercise to the student and of course that's a kind of euphemism that means possibly one of two things either I didn't bother to calculate it because it's trivial or it's too complicated and I didn't want to spend too much time doing this because that is the main point of this paper was was uh, actually as I as I mentioned the definition of center of mass N not not acceleration but but he did note that that this definition of acceleration was specifically different than than the um, acceleration defined by conventional relativity. And moreover, he, he was concerned that the uh, scalar magnitude might, might indicate that this uh, vector was no longer space-like, which, which would be conceptually maybe at least an issue uh, uh, from the point of view of conventional relativity. Hmm. So, so that's what that's really what I was um, worked on solving, um, and my my um, answer was that yes, he's correct that the acceleration as he's defined it uh, is not entirely space-like with respect to the observer. Um, there is a comment of uh, Coxan uh, in the chat that, that maybe is. Uh, yeah, okay. Says, I do not see the calculation of Ochevich's acceleration. I mean, components uh, AX, AZ. Yes. Yeah, oh, I mean, that's, that's the point. Uh, he, he is. Oh, he's saying, he's saying that this uh, 26, okay, maybe I'm, I'm, maybe I'm missing his reference here, but I think what he's trying to tell me is that I, I haven't actually calculated this relative acceleration yet. I mean, we've, we've only been talking about definitions. And that's really what I was going to do next. Uh, if I can find it here. Uh, so um, when I do these sort of calculations, um, I uh, almost overwhelmingly always try to do them uh, using a computer algebra system. Um, and that was one of the things that I, I did 
a lot with Oshevich was uh, take Oshevich's definitions and and convert them into operational uh, calculations in some computer algebra system. Um, my preferred al computer algebra system for this sort of thing is uh, Maple, uh, and that's that's the one that I use most uh, for this purpose. And I have several different. Well, I have a huge number of calculations that I did eventually with uh, in this context. But uh, this this is really what I advertised in my short introduction uh, to this talk was um, was to demonstrate um, the way in which I I used Maple to implement Oshevich's ideas and then uh, calculate very simply calculate expressions uh, that Oshevich had defined. Um, now, as, as far as I know, um, everyone here is prob everyone listening to the, how do I do that? Sorry, I'm just having trouble. Well, there it is, moving around. Um, probably no one here is um, that familiar or, or has used, has even used Maple before. Uh, I know uh, Jesus uh, often uses um, Mathematica for a similar reason. Uh, and the, the point here of, of using a computer algebra system is not because these calculations are especially difficult, but it's, it's rather that having to express mathematical ideas in a way that can be calculated by the computer is a kind of discipline, is a kind of test of, of your ability to actually uh, understand operationally uh, definitions that are being given by more abstractly. And um, one thing that's that comes out fairly easily, and you, you see this a lot in Clifford algebra work as well, that it's that having done that, you, you can then easily generate counterexamples uh, to to theorems and so forth. That so you you can you can't easily prove theorems in a method this way, but but you can easily disprove them, um, and you can explore them in a way that that is difficult to do on paper. I mean, because some of these things produce uh, huge numbers of expressions. Um, so in this case, we're not not too worried about it. But but if I did these uh, calculations of Lie brackets in um, in terms of uh, four dimensional space, um, like Minkowski space, then then the expressions involve uh, you know, hundreds hundreds of terms. Um, in other words, in you, you are forced to use coordinates then all the time when you're doing calculations. Mm, yeah, that's a good point. Um, now, in, in this uh, calculation with Maple, uh, I am using coordinates. Uh, Maple does have uh, a differential geometry package, um, which of course includes the uh, calculations using coordinates, but you can also define things more abstractly. Um, so you can define them in terms of of relationships between um, uh, intrinsic expressions. Um, these calculations are not very powerful because the algebra is not uh, easily computable um, in most cases with a computer algebra system. Since we're dealing with uh, expressions that are not commutative, then, then even the question of factoring and solving non-commutative equations is uh, difficult in computer algebra. Uh, algorithms exist, but but they're not complete, uh, not nearly as complete. So, yeah. so the calculate. Sorry. Yeah, usually, yeah. Uh, usually in Mathematica, you're forced to use matrices for non-commutative elements. Yeah. Well, mat matrices are are uh, a good way of representing these algebraic aspects of vectors. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, 
one shouldn't confuse vectors with with say uh, column matrices or something like that. Um, th this is a somewhat mm, well. It, it's a matter. It's a matter of the algebra versus the representation of the algebra. Uh, I think, and so a lot of the things that you can do in the representation are are easier than than, than you can do more abstractly. Um, but but it was, but this was another uh, beef or another point that Oshevich never tired of making is that he he did not want to use coordinates like he he thought coordinates were confusing that that led to a lot of uh, incorrect statements in relativity over the years and that he was convinced that that the correct way to do um, mathematics, especially in the case of relativity, but mathematics in general, was to avoid coordinates when at all possible. <laughs> the, the coordinates only came, entered when you might actually get to the point of making an, uh, an engineer might get to the point of making a measurement. Um, but in order to express the theory, coordinates were just a source of continual confusion. But, but it did seem to me like Ozhevich only wanted to use Grossman algebra, he didn't want to use Clifford algebra per se, or he thought he could do everything with Grossman algebra. I think it's more clumsy just to use only Grossman algebra myself. Well, uh, I think Olshevich's point of view would be that, that Clifford algebra is only one half of Grossman algebra. <laughs> that uh, that he, he Olshevich was, was convinced that one should view Grassmann algebra as giving rise to do two different algebras, um, an algebra of vectors or bivectors and an algebra of, of, of covectors uh, and two forms and multiforms. So th these are two separate subalgebras of Grassmann algebra, according to uh, Oshevich. Uh, and one of the main reasons for doing that was he wanted to be able to do a lot of the algebra without geometry. Um, and sorry, just meant to get rid of that. Get rid of, yeah. um, so he he wanted to define, as I said, the the uh, uh, metric as the isomorphism between these two subalgebras. And so when you think of when you see the operator G, uh, you should think of mapping. Like when, whenever I I write G here, and, and I have it here in this in this um, Maple worksheet. That's one of the first things I do is start defining these operations that uh, Oshevich has defined in the early part of his paper. So uh, the the two most uh, important operations, and all of these operations operate on the subalgebras, the Grassmann subalgebras, or between the subalgebras. So we've already seen an expression that involved evaluation um, and that is otherwise called the interior product or insertion. Uh, so, so this coding that you see here um, is maybe not, it's not, it's not so important to know exactly the details of this coding. It's, it's, this coding is related to uh, Maple's particular uh, implementation of differential geometry. So you know you don't you don't need to know too much about it other than to believe me that I've tested it and it does correctly represent the algebra. <laughs> but but we can uh, we can go into details um, for anybody who who cares to uh, go to that level. Um, so these these two operations are uh, adjoint. Uh, the, cre the creation of the creation operator is is the left multiplication, uh, Grassmann multiplication. So, um, in other words, this is just the exterior product uh, of P and Q, but it's viewed as an operation. Um, so we we operate on Q using P, and we get P much Q. Um, and here's, here's another important operation. And this is the uh, metric tensor. 
viewed as an isomorphism. So it also is an operator that maps from um, vectors and bivectors into uh, covectors and uh, two forms, uh, etc. And also the inverse. So this this metric is assumed to be uh, non-degenerate. Like we we can define find this. Uh, and so G, that, that's the same thing as saying that G is an isomorphism. Uh, and and that, that's, I think, uh, Garrett, one of the reasons why Bolshevich really emphasized Grassmann algebra over Clifford algebra, because in Clifford algebra, the metric enters in a much more implicit way, whereas in, uh, in Bolshevich's uh, Grassmann algebra, he wanted the metric to enter only when it was absolutely needed and in as explicitly a way as possible. But then he also argued in that paper that I mentioned earlier, in that paper from 1975 or so, that this was equivalent in the end, that, that really we, we were doing the same thing. We're using a different language to do the same thing. So. But there were aspects of Heston's uh, later development of relativity in terms of geometric algebra that Bolshevich did uh, take exception to. Like he, he didn't think that Heston's was doing uh, relativity the right way, or at least that's I'm sure he would have said it even more uh, more more emphatically. But but he he came to somewhat different conclusions because. It was mostly about the metaphysics behind relativity. Like that, Oshevich had a had a different view of what relativity means than what Hessenes was trying to express. Yeah. Well, his, his... well, of course, I'll be very I'm very interested in. It. I I know about this very well. Uh, there was a barrier between my my point of view doesn't follow Hessenes's point of view, but uh, I, I think it. it there's much to be said about it. And that was a barrier of communication between me and Ozevich and Heston is in uh, Ozevich as well. I'm sorry mm -hmm. that he's not here to defend himself. Yes, uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I agree. I mean, it would, uh, I, it's unfortunate. He only would have had to live a few more years <laughs> and, and we could have had some really great conversations because I do feel like I finally, after maybe 15 years or more, I, I do understand his his point of view about relativity, and and it can, differs. Like his view of relativity conceptually differs from from what is understood as as conventional relativity these days. Like, so he, how familiar are with how familiar are you with Hessenie's point of view of relativity? Not nearly as in depth, although I that was actually following Hestony's work, or really the work of uh, Doran and uh, Chris Doran and um, who is his team um, that came somewhat after Hestony's or in in conjunction with Hestony's. Uh, that was the reason why I met Oshevich in the first place because I was following that work, and so I decided, well, you know, I take some time off this summer and go to a Clifford Algebra conference. Um, because I really wanted to know something more about it. Uh, I mostly got interested in, in uh, Chris Doran's work because I was interested in relativistic uh, quantum dynamic, quantum mechanics and, and um, uh, Doran in particular had, uh, had done some pretty advanced work in terms of how one might express gravitation as a gauge theory um, and thereby uh, see how it could better relate to quantum mechanics. So, so that, that was my orientation about 15 or maybe even 20 years ago. Um, and the reason why I met Oshevich in the first place. Um, but it, uh, I have some more things to say about that during my talk. So. <laughs> yes, I, I look forward to that. Yeah, so so there's still a lot I could uh, I could understand from about Hessen's work uh, in this regard. If I if I may recall my conversation I had with um, Professor Ozievich, 
uh, by the possibility of embedding gravitation in the in the unit of relativistic quantum mechanics in the iso unit mm -hmm. because in this case then there are um, the difficulty that um, that you know we all know regarding grand unifications that seems to be much weaker if not um, very easily manageable it seems this point that my discussion with them is related to your your conversation i i believe yes i i, I think it is um th there are a couple of things that i would like to say maybe most directly to you dr Santilli. one of them uh, involves uh, shevich's view of of uh, uh, the nature of matter as being or material object as being requiring extension, right? So, so Ishevich, like you also, um, objected to the abstraction of a material object as a point. Um, that, that, you know, so all of Ishevich's work on relativity um, presumes that we're dealing with extended bodies. Like he, he, he never makes any statements in, about relativity that assumes that we can summarize a body as a point. In fact, he he part of being um, against the use of coordinates also made him strongly against the use of trajectory as a, as a fundamental idea. Um, so, that, yes. so so he wanted uh, essentially um, maybe I'm skipping a lot, but but really what Oshevich came down to believing was that in order to do relativity you really had to do a form of fluid dynamics that 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 really you needed a relativistic fluid dynamics in order to describe relativity um, in full detail and there are aspects of that here um, even in this work that i can point to but i wanted to make that point because uh, I think uh, offline on, in some emails between uh, you and I, Dr. Santilli, we were talking briefly about the no notion of spin. And, um, and I wanted to claim that uh, one can view spin as arising from uh, relativistic dynamics, uh, and not from quantum mechanics uh, as a fundamental idea. The fact that, that spin is quantized is, is another issue, but but it's um, so but if you get to the point of defining what spin is you need to be able to view material bodies as extended in some notion absolutely uh, okay. you, yeah so you need to be able to distinguish between the rotation of a material body and some other isom isomorphism some other isometric operation of course then the, then the ideas of string theory come in and i'm wondering whether that's related to Professor Santilli's ideas as well. The string theory is is, is also is the separate issue. If I may have a comment on um, on, on Doctor Page, yes, I agree with you fully that uh, that the notion of spin uh, is primarily a person. I see it as a geometrical entity, and uh, in any case, can be can be best described with algebra yeah. geometry. And, um, let, yeah, let let, let, let me emphasize that Oshevich would, as soon as you said geometry, I think he would probably disagree with you on principle. <laughs> but, but what, <laughs> yeah. what, be, he would, I think, and then this was one of the things that I was discussing with him uh, in his last days, um, was that I wanted to define uh, spin as um, double rotations basically uh, i don't know if you know the concept but, well, but you can define uh, when you have a four-dimensional space um, the possibility of of, of um, isometries uh, the number of isometries that you get that are related to rotation in three dimensions for example uh, is expanded right? so the things that you can do to a body um, for example like changing a, a left-handed glove into a right-handed glove is, is a kind of thing that you can do in four dimensions, but you can't do that in, in three dimensions. Um, and this, this is related to the fact that, that ordinary rotations are represented by simple bivectors, actually by the exponential of simple bivectors. 
Um, but not all bivectors are simple uh, in dimensions higher than three. Yeah, yeah. Right? So, so when you get to four dimensions, then you have non-simple bivectors, and the non-simple bivectors give rise to asymmetries that are not expressible as rotations. And and I wanted to insist with Loshevich that that it's these isometries that we talk about as spin, right? And uh, yeah. anyway, that's, <laughs> that's, yeah. that's quite a side issue. But uh, let let me also, in reference to Dr. Santilli, let let me want. I had a question specifically that I wanted to ask you, uh, and it was related. Oh, where did it? Okay, it was related to something that I wrote down earlier here. Uh, yes, it's related to torsion. Uh, well, I think I have a better expression here somewhere. Let me just bear with me and uh, skip ahead where it's more explicit. Uh, yeah, that's not particularly good either. Uh, so so let, let me go back to where it was. I'm um, sorry for jumping around, and I don't want to confuse you. But... To close, if I may, just uh, sorry to interrupt, but uh, then go ahead. To emphasize the the, the, the significance for um, uh, for uh, you know actual uh, you know real concrete solid physics of what we were discussing. In, in my view, the, um, this goes back to the hypothesis hypothesis by um, by Fermi, and has been confirmed by Weisskopf at MIT and. And many others that uh, the reason why we are unable to um, we have been unable with quantum mechanics to represent exactly the magnetic moment of um, of nuclei is that because uh, that's their their hypothesis that um, proton and neutrons may may experience a deformation whenever they are member of a nuclear structure. Mm -hmm. So sure, the deformation. Yeah. The deformation is crucially so. The moment we represent, that's been what I tried in my little work. The moment we are able to represent the deformation, then we are, then we are absolutely, we are in final, finally, after a century, we are in a position to represent exactly, uh, exactly the um, nuclear magnetic. And from there on, we have new avenue of fusion and many, many other things. Back to the deformation, the, 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 the notion of spin should be completed. It goes back to the uh, the point like abstraction of quantum mechanics is, is excessive for nuclear physics. So, mm. so that's uh, the effort is to um, the represent, you know, the spin for an extended body. Because the moment we expand, uh, represent it for an extended body, then we can uh, very simply represent uh, quantitatively Fermi's and Weisskopf idea, and then we have new evidence. And... Sorry, I just wanted. Yeah, to... but yeah, can... no, that's fine. Uh... My, I was emphasizing mostly that in Oshevich's approach to relativity, that uh, he deals abstractly, at least, with the notion that we need to understand motions of extended bodies in relativity. And this, this goes back to well, some early paradoxes in relativity about uh, like a, ro a rotation, rotating solid body. Yes. And, uh, you know, so that there are problems uh, with what we mean by rotation, even in that context. Um, Excuse me, one question. I don't understand here the, the idea of extended body, because in fact, I think that we can uh, uh, point uh, the the problem in terms of the degree of the quantity that are describing that uh, 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 and, and are, uh, that, that uh, quantity. Then uh, uh, I, uh, I remember that the idea of uh, Extended body is uh, came from the uh, continuum mechanics, mm -hmm. and uh, and then uh, we uh, uh, use that only by a, a way of understand uh, how to get that, that that kind of quantity, but uh, in fact. Uh, we 
arrive to one description of point mass <laughs> at the well, end. Uh, uh, Jesus, uh, I think, at least from my, my conceptualization of this comes from fluid dynamics. And so, as you said, uh, you know, mathematics, continuum mathematics is, is some generalization of that. And in fluid dynamics, it's very common to talk about fluid particles. Um, so, but it's it's written with quotes, right? It's written, uh, this, this is an infinitesimal part of a fluid, right? Um, and so that we can talk about uh, uh, streamlines and uh, uh, other other notions that are uh, related to trajectories, but the underlying dynamics is not dynamics of trajectories. It's it's the dynamics oh, of no. the fluid. No, right? trajectory trajectory are no longer but, as acceptable under an extent for an extended body, in my view. Well, yeah. you might you, that. Well, this this is a another issue that that is bothering me a lot too, and that is Lagrangian version of fluid dynamics versus the Euler version of fluid dynamics. So yes, yes. If if you take the Lagrangian view of fluid dynamics, then then we take the view that we can label individual particles of the fluid, and that the way we label these fluid particles is involved in the way we express the dynamics or or another way of saying that is that we think of trajectories of particles as interacting with each other so that so that we cannot describe um, dynamics of a single path but because these paths all interact with each other so that we express like changes in density as as how close together line these these streamlines are for example, in um, and but we know, but what we mean by how close together has to be defined carefully in terms of how we label the individual um, particle fluid elements. And there, there's now, and this relates to Oshevich's approach to relativity because Oshevich's approach is very Eulerian, right? He he doesn't want to talk about a Lagrangian version of, of relativity, right? And that would be equivalent to saying, talking about relativity in terms of, of trajectories. So all of the operations that Oshevich is defining are, are operations um, at a higher level, in effect. Um, and that at, at most we can talk about congruences, that is like uh, groups of trajectories uh, that somehow cover space and they constitute a representation of, say, the solution of some differential equations uh, that relate to the to equations that would otherwise be expressed in Eulerian views. So, so this is probably one of the, the sources of conceptual difficulty between what Oshevich was saying about relativity and almost everyone else, like in, in conventional relativity want to start by talking about paths. Like you, we want to start with a particle and, and we want to say how that particle is moving and define even defining velocity, right, is done in terms of these paths, of these trajectories. And ultimately defining acceleration is the second derivative with respect to some sure. trajectory, right? Sure. But uh, everything Olshevich is doing here is completely avoiding that. It doesn't talk about trajectories at all. The, the, in a sense, the, the the bottom line here is that we associate with a material body some time-like vector field. Now, I've been maybe I've been saying vector, but really X is a vector field. It's defined over some manifold or some variety, uh, usually a Minkowski kind of variety. Uh, and it's that, and it's because of X is a vector field, that's the sense in which this represents an extended body. And the, so that this, this X is, is not like a delta function. It's, 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 a, it's a, a vector that has some values over some small domain. Uh, and so 
this domain over which it has a non-zero value is the extent, is the extension of the, the physical extension of the material body. Does it mean that the, the interval of the definition is the representation of the dimension or I miss, I miss something? Yeah, well, how should I say this? That, that, that it's, that it's amb ambiguous as to, with respect to the shape or size of the body, because we don't, that, that's implicit in how we define the vector field. So it's, it's like, 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 so for example, if we have a scalar value, like, like, uh, like density, so then an extended body is, is described by a field with, with a kind of a bump in it, right? Like, a, so the, the scalar values, it's this, this field is zero everywhere, except where the body is located. Yes. Right? But it's not a delta, it's, it's, it has some, some non, non degenerate shape, some, Whereas particle mechanics or conventional mechanics can be expressed as saying that all of the fields are delta functions, are Dirac delta functions, or something like that. So they're all singular, whereas we don't want them to be singular here. Uh, but in any case, uh, let me try to ask. I know time is running, and I haven't answered <laughs> Grega's question about uh, uh, the actual calculation that I, I'm trying to get to, but. I still do want to ask uh, Dr. Santilli, uh, or at least sort of well, try to ask a question. And that is that in his, in the ISO theory, one tries to change the definition of the Lie bracket, right? so that so that we get uh, an ISO Lie theory, so that so that instead of having a Lie bracket, we have some kind of generalization of this new. Uh, uh, an isotopy of, of the Lie bracket, and we expect this isotopy to be useful in describing dynamics of an extended body. So that that's like changing the definition of of, of this Lie bracket here. That this is written. This is just another notation for Lie bracket. I, sh I should write, you know, bracket x y bracket. Uh, so that's it's just the same yeah. notation. I understand. Um, <clears throat> I understand the notation. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So, so the the point is though that that if we look at this uh, definition of torsion, and if we assume uh, a geometry in which the the torsion is zero, then we can interpret this uh, structural equation as a definition of the Lie bracket in in terms of the covariant derivative. Yes. So that's clear, right? Yes. Uh, and and this this allows us to to generalize the Lie bracket to situations like in um, uh, Riemann geometries, for example, like just arbitrary Riemann geometries. We can, we we say um, what the connection is, what the metric is, and then we know how to calculate the Lie bracket. And so the usual definition usual way of dealing with this and you see you see this in fluid dynamics even is that that you can use Riemann geometry to represent um, dynamics right uh, and it um, how should I say this so so what I what I was going to try to ask is is the use of isometry, equivalent to the use of non non Riemann geom well of of Riemann geometries right so instead of trying to express something in in a flat space time Minkowski space time if if we have a, a Riemann geometry of some sort uh, that describes that we'd otherwise think of as curvature etc then this curvature represents a kind of change of shape of something of deformation uh, and so this, the deformation that's implicit in the geometry gives rise to Lie brackets that differ from flat space. So, so the, do, do these Lie brackets differ in the same way that they differ when you consider is, isotopy? Right? So that, yeah. Yes, let me, 
there is a very very intriguing question. I will think about. I will think a little bit, uh, particularly with respect to you know the torsion and covariant derivative. The the um, per my experience, the 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 isotopy I, I find it useful for my need, at least for my specific needs, in a number of ways. First of all, to simplify, um, uh, simplify calculation. For instance, I was curious to ask you when where you were indicating before uh, the complexity of the calculations. I was about to yeah. ask what was the origin of the complexity. In my case, yeah. um, well, in my case, the problem- I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't mean to imply that the, that the uh, calculations were complex. In fact, they're, they're really quite simple, but- Oh, okay, but they, okay, I misunderstood. But, but the, but the uh, complication comes with dealing with a very large number of terms. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Now, now I understand. Yes, so, no, that's a different issue now. But in in my case, the the isotopy of the Lie bracket uh, helped me. For instance, when there is a, um, when there are nonlinear interaction, if I um, embed all mm -hmm. nonlinear term in the um, isotopic element, then uh, basically the the theory become isolinear, as we discussed very briefly the other day, namely. Mm -hmm. the, so the from a conceptual viewpoint becomes kind of equivalent conceptually. Uh, to such an extent, also technically to a, um, a linear theory, but um, there are other. Um, but the point of whether the, what you indicated, um, I agree fully. There is a very deep uh, connection with uh, with gravity. Uh, the isotopy of Lie um, Lie theory and the gravitation, the, the, to my understanding, is very deep. Basically, this was um, a contribution which I made uh, to Marcel Grossman. Um, meeting in mm -hmm. Jerusalem, uh, this, uh, I think, to 2001, 2002. The idea was elementary, it was just to um, pick up the um, Riemannian metric. You factorize out of the Riemannian metric, you factorize the Minkowski metric, and you mm -hmm. end up with the four by four um, matrix, which contains all, all, of, all of gravitation, the rest. And, um, and also from the topology, you know that the four by four matrix is the positive definite. Um, a conclusion. But then you introduce, uh, then having done that, then you introduce uh, isotopy in order to represent. Uh, yes, I assume the isotopic element to be identical to the to this four by four matrix, which is uh, which is to call it gravitational isotopic element out of the by factorizing out the Minkowski element. But um, that's only the beginning. Because when yeah. you look at um, when you look at um, at uh, look at uh, the structure, the dependence, the dependence of that uh, representation of gravitation, you can see that you have a representation of uh, this Baxter short side, the idea that uh, you know there is exterior gravitation and interior gravitation, exterior mm -hmm. gravitation everybody accepted, but uh, the interior gravitation. Uh, was not accepted. It was the second paper by Schwarzschild, but uh, it might be not as important as the first. Well, let, let me. Um, I, I, we can go down that path even deeper. I think after you get a chance to tell us more about uh, isocalculus and so forth. Yes, um, this was my. Question. But I, I do. I do want to mention one other thing that that keeps propping up in my mind, and and that is something that the electrical engineers like to call uh, metric engineering in in electromagnetism. And this, this metric engineering concept uh, arose when electrical engineers started talking about non-standard constitutive conditions. Um, you, you know, there's something called met, the whole theory of metamaterials and so forth that have, have unusual electromagnetic properties because of their, the constitutive conditions are not natural in some form, some sense. They, they've been engineered. And, and this turned out to be fairly closely related to work that um, another physicist named E.J. Post. Uh, you may, Post, uh, uh, E.J. Post uh, published several papers describing how the constitutive conditions in electromagnetism could be viewed in terms of modified geometry. And so the, the geometry was, yeah. Um, Riemannian, and that the curvature, the Riemannian curvature, uh, corresponded to the constitutive conditions, and that um, in electromagnetism, and this this transformation from from conventional electromagnetism in in Minkowski space to electromagnetism in a 
fictional uh, Romanian geometry uh, allowed for the possibility of, of engineering metamaterials in a way that that doesn't arise naturally in electromagnetism. Uh, I, do you? I, I agree with you, but I don't think it's the only way to represent the metamaterial. There are other very intriguing fields. Yes, but I but what what got me thinking along these lines was that your your reference to to say uh, objects being embedded in other objects, thinking electron being embedded in in terms of into a protein proton as being re related to dealing with the dynamics of the electron in non-standard constitutive situation yes. there's a connection with metamaterial you're correct absolutely correct yes. uh, anyway okay that's uh, <laughs> let let me skip on because i i know greg is would like, would to, like uh, to conclude i would like to conclude that um, your your presentation at least um, uh, i found it extremely interesting that in the event uh, it can be uh, indeed, I believe so, but uh, it can be uh, reformulated on the isotopy. There are, I think the broadening of well, the application yeah. will be substantial. Will be substantial. But, it all but, depends on the isodifferential calculus. It's a, you have to use an isocovariant derivative, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. isotorsion, and so on. That has to be done from A to C. But um, well, the applications are yeah. significant. And also because the regaining of uh, the possibility of regaining a uh, crisis, it may seem is a dream, let me say so. The possibility of re regaining linearity for a, 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 what in reality is a Riemannian, Riemannian context. And the moment of regaining li uh, linearity allows the construction of a symmetry, a symmetry for, mm -hmm. the, for the interval, which is otherwise prohibited in a Riemannian structure. Sorry for okay. the. Sorry no, for no, that's fine. Uh, we, we definitely will get to this in more detail later. Uh, so let me just skip very quickly through this because I do want to get back to the end again. Um, so I am defining here, for example, a, uh, a an arbitrary time like vector in, in uh, one plus one dimensions. Um, and so we have here a uh, the, this time like vector x sub t uh, is referring to a material body and so we define another arbitrary time like vector so these are uh, normalized time like vectors but we think of them as representing material bodies and and we don't want to think of this v x of t as being a velocity in any sense it's just a parameter of of this representation of this time-like vector. So uh, maybe maybe I I know this notation could could get confusing, but ultimately we can define, for example, what Ishevich called relative velocity. Right? That so we define that in terms of an operation on these time-like vectors, and part of that. Uh, ends up involving this uh, gamma factor. But the gamma factor is, is uh, determined by both x and y. So this is not like a, this is not quite the same thing as the gamma factor that you see in, in conventional relativity, but because it's generalized to being independent of the observer as such, but just as, as a relationship between two material bodies. In any case, let, let's skip on. So now uh, we can define um, conventional acceleration in relativity this way, right? uh, in terms of this um, uh, this is that, yeah. So so in fact, th this is actually the um, uh, Covector corresponding to acceleration, but its magnitude square is is given by this. And in particular, notice that it's it's strictly positive. Whereas the important thing later, let's see, we skip on and do more of this. I don't want to go too far. Uh, okay, so we can we can show that. Uh, where did I do this? Okay, sorry. 
Uh, okay, that's yes. So so now now the important the simple calculation that gets that does end up having a large number of expressions is this uh, Lie derivative of Lie, Lie bracket really of x with respect to the relative velocity. So this is the time like vector here x, and this relative velocity is is a, a space like vector with respect to x. Uh, that represents the relative velocity of y with respect to x. And so Eshevich defined uh, acceleration as the Lie bracket with respect to the observer. Uh, and he shows that in the limit of uh, a non-relativistic limit, that this is identical to defining uh, acceleration as the second derivative. Along the path, right? But this definition doesn't have anything, doesn't depend in any way on the notion that that x is inertial or or anything like that. We don't have to make any assumptions about it. Um, just that we want to see how the relative velocity changes with respect to changes in the observer and vice versa. Uh, so this, this in the end, it was fairly easy to answer the question in in Oshevich's paper. Like we just, uh, but by ins inserting this uh, acceleration vector into the covector associated with the observer, we can see that it has a non-zero time-like part, and so this this is the the time-like part of the uh, uh, acceleration defined by Moshevich. And if we do the same calculation uh, for the conventional acceleration, we get zero. Uh, and moreover, if X is an inertial observer, then we also get zero. So that so Moshevich's definition is space-like provided that the observer is inertial. Um, which being, is nice. Uh, being space, space, space time, is there any in the superluminal um, contribution somewhere? Well, you might think of being time like as being superluminal in some generic sense of the word. Um, but the idea that, that acceleration can have a, a, a time like component is, is conceptually a problem, perhaps. Right? It's, it's what what do we mean by uh, an acceleration that is not strictly space-like? Right. So so we we understand something being space-like like as being like in the same you know, synchronous time. So we say you know something has a certain velocity with respect to us, provided that we can define what we mean by now across space right so we need to we need to be able to synchronize then we can say how things so so all this is what minkowski said back in 1908 is that 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 relative velocity has to be space like in minkowski space and that because it's space like meaning it's in the kernel of of the time like vector that represents the observer so it it means it's it's not it doesn't change in time now one thing i didn't wasn't able to to go into today was was Oshevich's view of vectors and because and this I, I wanted to emphasize this but there's just not going to be enough time and that is that every time i said vector field uh, i should have really said derivation right because Vector fields in Oshevich's view are um, linear differential operators. They 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 are defined by uh, as as derivations on some underlying field, some underlying scalar field, or or more properly stated, uh, an R algebra. That is like a, a an algebra of functions over some field, and so. 
every time, so that, that's why we can describe, I think it's an answer to Garrett's question earlier about what we mean by Lie bracket between two vectors, is that, that we operate on one vector, we compose one vector with another because we think of these vectors as operations, as operators. So, so we compose one vector with another and then we subtract it from the composition in the other order and that is the Lie bracket. And it has the same degree. So it's, it's not a bi, Lie bracket of two vectors is not a bivector because the composition of two operators is still an operator, it's still a vector, right? Um, so that, that's critical to the overall mathematical approach that Mashevich is taking here. Um, and so the, the, the main reason that Oshevich wanted to define acceleration in terms of the Lie bracket is because he wanted to have an analog to his second derivative. But the second derivative is not a derivation. <laughs> so that, this is a technical problem. And that, that was the whole point of the definition of covariant derivative in differential geometry was to come up with some definition of derivative that was a derivation. Um, but if we take the Lie bracket of two vectors, then we do have a sense in which the Lie bracket is a derivation of the algebra defined by those vectors as elements of a vector of a vector of a. Yeah, it's a beautiful idea. Yes. Right. So, so the Lie bracket is a derivation, and so it it amounts to the. So, so whenever you operate with a vector. The vector is an operator. So when you operate with a vector, you're actually differentiating something. You're, you're, so you, you've always, you always have to think of them in terms of linear operators. And so the Lie bracket is another type of operator, but on vectors. So, so that, that was his idea of how to define acceleration in, in a completely intrinsic way and a completely geometry-free way. Right? We, we don't need geometry to define what we mean by Lie bracket. That's, but geometry does come in, and it comes in here where I was, uh, I don't, well, let me go back here. Geometry comes in right here, right? Because the Lie bracket is related to the covariant derivative in exactly this way. And the covariant derivative expresses something about geometry. You need to know in order to calculate the covariant derivative, we need to know the connection, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So so when we when we talk about um, acceleration in conventional relativity, we're uh, using just the covariant derivative. And we we this this means that what we're talking about is essentially geometric. Um, and this, this is strongly objected to by Oshevich in his paper. He said this, this was equivalent of, you know, was, was the greatest, one of the greatest mistakes of Einstein was to accept this definition of acceleration in terms of the covariant derivative, because he said that makes acceleration an absolute concept, right? That we only need one body in order to define you know, the acceleration. So it's no longer a relative concept. And so he wanted all, all, uh, all, all of relativistic kinetics to be about relativity and not about absolute things. But the point, the whole point of my, my whole concluding remark would be that that we we can have both, right? <laughs> that, that there is a way in which we can really have both because. Um, we can accept geometry as a way of representing Lie brackets. Um, and when we do that, then having accepted geometry, then we can relate the conventional definition of, of um, acceleration to Ashevich's definition of intrinsic definition of acceleration. But in, in order to do that, geometry enters in an essential way. And the whole objective of Loshevich was to do everything without geometry. So that um, that's why he wanted to do, that's why he wanted to redefine what we mean by acceleration. 
and ultimately to, to define relativistic dynamics completely intrinsically without, without any reference to geometry. So that, that's, that's sort of where I'd like to end. And I don't know. Okay, and let, let me read uh, uh, Greg's comments because he, he's also sent me a few um, emails. We haven't exchanged a lot, but we obviously don't agree uh, on uh, a number of things. Uh, and I know Greg's also has had uh, extensive communications with the Shevich. And as you know, Greg has last, last week uh, presented uh, a, a very different definition of acceleration, but, but it was still my understanding that it was Greg's point of view that, that he could express what Oshevich was talking about in, in the form that he, in the geometric form that he presented last week. But my claim would be opposite of that. That, that Oshevich's definition of acceleration is intrinsically without geometry. And that geometry, if we use geometry at all, we have to be very careful. So, so let me uh, just say, oh, it's okay. I just want to skip back. You, you, maybe you also can read the chat, uh, but I'll just try to. Uh, okay, it's a little hard to relate his comments here. So he said, can I ask for a summary on the calculation of the components of AX, AY, AZ of Elshevich's acceleration? Is it equation 17? So I think he's referring to 17 in my maple worksheet. Um, so my answer to Greg is, is no, it's not equation 17, it's equation 16. Is, is the Olshevich's acceleration in terms of components. So uh, here is the uh, uh, basis, D, D sub T is the basis, is the time basis. So that's equivalent to saying that this is the time component and the space component is this uh, DX uh, component, sorry. So the space component. So I'm only doing things in in two dimensions here. So uh, so that is what he would call ax and at. Is that is that clear? He he wrote uh, a sub x, and so so this this uh, this component, this part that is multiplied by this uh, basis vector, uh, sorry, let me take, uh, come on, get up there. I can't quite highlight the right part. Uh, well, I wanted to highlight, but, al but also including this factor in front. Ah, it's a little hard. So uh, to understand this notation, so D sub X is a basis vector and so this is a scalar value multiplying some basis vector. So it's it's so in other words, this scalar value is the component of a of a vector in some basis. In the right, so that I I think that should be clear. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble highlighting this properly. But but in any case, so my answer is that that's it's equation sixteen and. If uh, Greg has wanted, I could give him the same components for x, y, and z, but in that case, the expressions involved would be quite a bit bigger. And so this is, it was sufficient for my purposes here just to show that uh, that there was a non-zero time-like part. Um, and so I don't really need uh, four-dimensional space for that. So what is the result for an inertial observer? Okay, so I just, I answered that question, right? That, uh, that for an inertial observer, uh, it is entirely space-like. Right? So, so this time-like component is only non-zero if the observer is not inertial. Uh, okay, 
And Larissa asked a question, vector is a derivation of the decaying ring. Yes, um, exactly. That, that is um, Lachevich's point of view, right? That, uh, that a vector is a derivation of a ring. Uh, of course, in physics, most of the rings we consider are also fields um, in the mathematical sense of field, uh, usually over real numbers or complex numbers, etc. So, and derivations are operators, as, as I mentioned. Okay, so Gregor says to me, I claim that you did not recognize the real interpretation of Ishevich's acceleration. I am waiting for an explicit derivation for an initial observer. Meanwhile, I have to go. Goodbye. Uh, so my explicit derivation for an initial observer, um, uh, I could easily do that. Uh, what I would have to do is just make V no longer dependent on T and X uh, in expression 16 instead of in expression 17. But, uh, let's see, did I, maybe I even did that. Yes, I did do that. So, so what Greg is, is asking for uh, uh, is the explicit derivation for an initial inertial observer and and that's what what this this is here. And uh, although th this is space like with respect to the observer, not space like with respect to d sub t. d sub t is an arbitrary basis vector. Right? But if we if we ask what is it with respect to to x t? Uh, so x t x sub t is the time-like vector representing the observer, and so we can show that that this that in the case of an inertial observer, then this definition of acceleration is time-like because it's uh, this evaluation is is zero. It's in other words, it's in the kernel of the observer space. So that's. Uh, I know that that, un that understanding the results of these calculations in detail and relating them to the way that Maple requires me to write them it takes some time, right? but but that is my that's what that's what the reason why I did this particular calculation was to show that it is space like. Um, so my understanding from Gregas is that he doesn't get in his interpretation, he doesn't get any expressions that are nearly as complicated looking as this. Uh, so uh, I, we still need to get to the point of that. Uh, okay, and Garrett said, uh, Hesse is uh, claimed that algebra without geometry is blind and geometry without algebra is dumb. Um, <laughs> Yes, uh, I think that that's uh, that's a very reasonable. I, I, I like that statement. Um, it, it brings to mind the a statement that I quoted often to uh, Shevich about Einstein. Actually, that there was a Einstein was considered to be the you know, origin of the idea that that geometry or the geometry of physical space was somehow um, you know, that the space itself or that geometry itself was somehow physical is a statement about physical. So, so we even talk about gravitational waves as if they are waves in space time. Okay? But, but this is a very peculiar notion, right? That, that we can have waves in something that is defined by geometry, right? Like, uh, so if that- I, If I may- so, if I may ab ab object of the, no, with all due respect, of course, to Einstein and the, the, the you see the point, my difficulty with the, the concept is, is that I do not know how to, how to formulate Maxwell equation in a Riemannian geometry. So that's what, <clears throat> go back to the point that, that, that this formulation should be broadened. Then, <clears throat> then I believe that Einstein idea yeah. can be inco incorporated. But, but that, so, but that uh, formulating electromagnetism in Riemann geometry was exactly what E.J. Post was doing 
that, that's what I mentioned earlier, right? Uh, but there was he, something. He said that say? if if you formulate electromagnetism in Riemann geometry, then you have a whole new notion of what is uh, how to represent the constitutive conditions in electromagnetism. Very very true, but uh, there are difficulty in how to reconcile them with experimental evidence on actual. Uh, you know, on little things, little charges, moving charges, and so on. To my recollection, though, to be honest, uh, but um, yeah. my my point is that uh, that when there are uh, usually when there are this type of difficulty, it does not necessarily mean that the main idea is wrong. No, it means that perhaps the mathematics that we use is not sufficiently broad. Yeah, well, I think that's true. And but let, let me get back to to uh, Garrett's point, or at least Hessenley's point, and that is that. Um, Einstein later in later years, uh, in like, I think it was 1937 or so, well after the development of general relativity, he made a speech in which he said, I finally agree that Poincaré was correct, right? That, that Poincaré insisted that geometry was only convention. But when he meant by convention, of course, was a complicated thing. It was a, a, a complicated mathematical construction. But Poincaré would have said that geometry has nothing to do with physics. It, it's only a matter of convenient description, the convenience of our description of space. Right? And so that, that Einstein is credited with sort of giving the notion of space, uh, like a physical basis. But, but later on, Einstein actually said, I, I don't really believe that, that, that gravitation has anything to do with curvature. The curvature is a concept in geometry. And that, <laughs> so that, that I, and I quoted this with Shevich several times, and he never completely accepted my, my reference to this. But there, it's, if anybody's interested in following that up, I think I can prove my point now. A little better, and that is that, that Einstein said, "Well, it, it's a it's only a matter of convention, but it's a really very good convention, right? <laughs> that 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 it was essential to the development of general relativity to think of gravitation in terms of curvature, but that by no no means implies that gravitation is curvature. And in fact, later on, in about the 1940 something, Einstein actually published several papers." showing that you can develop gravitation in terms of torsion. This torsion later became known as teleparallel theories of gravitation. And to bring it back to the beginning, these teleparallel theories of gravitation are strongly related to the way that Chris Doran wanted to treat relativity in, in Heston's formalism, right? Is the fact that it, that that because because teleparallel gravity can has a gauge form <laughs> so so you can so if you accept that gravity is described not by curvature but by by the torsion in space then there's a natural way in which you can define potentials and so you end up with being able to describe gravitation and teleparallel theories of gravitation as a gauge theory and and i and i got to the point, I think, of trying to understand the, the relationship between that and, uh, and Clifford Algebra and Hessenny's approach. Uh, well, I just, but, but it's... i just like to say that there are, of course, many geometries. There's, there's a poly algebra of space, Minkowski of space-time, and you can go to higher order geometries as well. So. There's no limitation of what geometry is really, or representing by algebra. The, the, the close connection with algebra and geometry extends to, to higher dimensions as well. Um, normally, when when um, Clifford algebra people talk about geometry, they tend to be talking about some um, flat Minkowski space, right? <laughs> Generally speaking, uh, not the Riemannian metrics, right? But a you, lot of you also have De Sitter space that goes up to another dimension. Mm. String theory, yeah, I well, guess, goes I, up to string theory goes up to ten dimensions. There's, you know, there's all kinds of geometries. 
yeah, but, but I, hmm, I, I don't think I've never felt really much like like the number of dimensions was a very important concept, as long as you had enough dimensions. <laughs> so enough means four, right? So, so things are different between three dimensions and four dimensions, but they're not nearly so different between four and five and six as they are between three and four. And there's good reasons for that. It, it, they come from Lee theory, really. Right? Yeah. That's where things get <clears throat> complicated. I, I do not know whether you may be interested that those um, um, hyperdimensional theory, including string theory that um, Dr. Garrett mentioned before, they can uh, apparently can be reformulated in a in a multi-value four-dimensional theory. In other words, the, the each axis or each um, reference, reference line is multi-valued. So, so in for the string theories, you know, to assume three that each reference space reference axis only has, has three value, and, uh, and then you end up with the 12 dimension of, of uh, as interpreted by the string theory. Uh, uh, people, the, 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 this uh, this um, avenue, from what I heard, seems to be of some significance because because at the abstract level, then the theory is three dimensional in space, and therefore it admits um, experimental verification. Now, string theory I have no experimental verification that I am aware of because of the multi dimensionality, the, the um, higher dimensionality. But um, but by returning to um, assuming a multi-valued uh, three-dimensional or four-dimensional, then um, I'm, I'm sorry, um, we may perhaps we may perhaps uh, uh, regain. Sorry for the deviation. No uh, I think we should should end soon. Uh, but I could mention that one subject that I would like to talk about in the future has not very strong connections to relativity theory at all, but but rather to quantum mechanics. Uh, I, I think there there are ways in which I could relate what I want to talk about to relativity, but but I, I for a long time I've had a, a strong interest in uh, uh, many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. Um, and not, not Everett's many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, but rather uh, Bill Poirier's interpretation of quantum mechanics that is based on Bohmian ideas. Right? And that, that this, this introduces an, a concept that Einstein probably wouldn't have liked very much, right? That, that, that the idea that there are many interacting worlds and that, that one can express quantum mechanics in this way. And I just mentioned in passing that nothing in what Oshevich did in relativity precludes there being something other than space, right? So, so he only insists that a material body be represented by a time-like vector and that what he calls space is everything else, right? But that everything else is, you know, could include not only what space you, you are, your location in space, but also could include other independent variables, like what world you were in. And just to bring it to, back to the connected thing that I mentioned earlier, this notion of what world you're in is related to labeling particles in the Lagrangian form of, of uh, fluid dynamics. So, so if you're willing to extend uh, the Eulerian formulation that Oshevich is using for relativity, you can extend that to a Lagrangian form, but you aren't limited to, to describing trajectories in space. Right? They, they, they would be trajectories, but they could be multiple trajectories in different worlds interacting in order to provide quantum mechanics. That's the, so that would, that would be my ultimate goal or, or hope is that by using Ashevich's approach to relativity, one would find a way to incorporate quantum mechanics in a deep way into relativity. That's very interesting. Very interesting topic indeed. Too, amb too ambitious, but, but no, I no, no. I... That's why it's interesting because it's ambitious. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Jesus, you didn't cut me off at time.
<laughs> oh, sorry. Um, uh, I, I think that the, uh, there was uh, some comments in the chat about uh, how much time, and uh, uh, finally one uh, one was uh, about uh, uh, of, of officially uh, is uh, at uh, twelve thirty, but uh, yes. not problem but not probably okay. then uh, okay uh, sorry right. no no it's fine i i didn't want i mean of course people are free to to leave when they have to of course but just uh, i when, when i'm speaker i i have much less conscious awareness of what time how much time has passed even when i look at the clock i want to keep talking <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah okay well uh I, thanks very much for discussion today and I look forward to uh, to hearing from Garrett and we'll continue the, the subject of uh, relativity next week yes yeah. in yet another formalism yeah okay okay bye for now very well and thank you gentlemen and uh, uh, very, very very simulating indeed <laughs>